go. Welcome to the Get the Facts series. And of course, kicking off our series to speak about the history of equality in the Bahamas is going to be lawyer and international award-winning writer Marion Bethel. She was educated at the University of Valencia, at McGill University, and at Columbia University. Marion began teaching in the Bahamas and became a lecturer at the College of the Bahamas. She studied law at Cambridge University, then started practicing law bar exams in September 1980. In 2012, Marion directed Womanish Ways, Freedom, Human Rights, and Democracy, the Women's Suffrage Movement in the Bahamas, 1948 to 1962, a documentary on the struggle to gain women the right to vote in the Bahamas. The film won a 2012 award in documentary at the Urban Suburban International Film Festival in Philadelphia. I think I've said enough. Without any further ado, welcome to our introductory series on you know, the 2016 referendum, Marion Bethel. Thank you. Um, Tenille, thank you. Tenille thank, thank, thank you so very much for organizing this webinar series on on gender equality and non-discrimination on the basis of sex in regard to our pending upcoming uh, referendum on June 7th. I really appreciate this opportunity to um, talk about the referendum on gender equality and non-discrimination. And in particular, my task uh, tonight is to really look at the social historical context of the referendum and the, the equality bills, as they are called, and the non-discrimination on the basis of sex. I think it's really important uh, that we understand the a, a context for these bills. Um, they're not in isolation. They just didn't pop out of it, of nowhere. And uh, history as to where we are today and why we are where we are today, trying to um, vote on these bills. The electorate has the opportunity now to vote on June 7th. The bills have been passed in both houses of parliament values are anchored in our historic struggle for the right to equality and the right to non-discrimination. These are principles that Bahamians are really familiar with. We, we've, we've struggled since the 40s, 50s, and 60s for these rights of equality and non-discrimination. So they are not new to us in any way. The way that they have come to us under the Constitution at this point in time is that they refer to equality in regard to women and men under the Constitution, and it refers also to the principle of non-discrimination on the basis of sex. So Bahamians, women and men from all walks of life and racial backgrounds believed in these two principles of equality, believed in the principle of non-discrimination, and were committed and are still committed to seeing these principles in our Constitution in regard to women and men being treated equally and having the same status under our Constitution and working towards achieving the same. Gender equality then, that is the equality between women and men and non-discrimination on the basis of sex are principles and values. They, they are human principles and they mean that in my view, these two principles should be treated as a goal, a critical goal of our democracy, of our nation building, of our national development, in, and our good governance in the Bahamas. These two principles of equality are human rights principles that establish the social, economic, cultural, civic, and political rights of women and men. They go hand in hand. Equality and non-discrimination go hand in hand. Non-discrimination is an integral part of the principle of equality. It guarantees and ensures that no one is denied her his rights because of factors such as race, place of origin, color, creed, and on June 7th, we hope to put sex as one of those categories, <clears throat> meaning female or male. So this is a real moment in our history right now where we have the opportunity to decide the kinds of values and principles we want in this particular regard. And my feeling and my thoughts and my commitment is to equality between women and men and that we are not discriminated on the basis that we are female or male. And so that is what I'm trying to put forward today and to ask people to consider this as part of our social historical journey to this point. 
In the 40s, 50s, and 60s, our leaders, Sir Lyndon Pindling, Sir Arthur Folkes, Clarence Bain, Arthur Hanna, Arthur Folkes, they all gave us a vision of what life could be like if we struggled during the 40s, 50s, and 60s. We did. And that was the road to self-determination, the road to majority rule. And as we all know, that road was not a straight road. It had many turns and twists to it. And with, with the Burma Road riots, we then moved on to the, the great strike, the strike, and then we had Black Tuesday and majority rule in 1967 and independence in 1973. This whole journey was instrumental. It was what shaped the modern Bahamas. And during this period, we fought for civil and political rights. We fought for the right to establish trade unions, for example. We fought for the right to vote. We fought for the right for educational opportunity, economic opportunity. We fought for the right to racial equality during this period. And so where we are today is really an extension of these rights. We live in a democracy, and so there are evolving rights. The right to vote was the first formalized vote where we had gender discrimination. Women couldn't vote up to 1962. And so that is where we formalized the, 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 the fight for gender equality. We are now at the stage where we are, we are demanding and asking for equality under our constitution. That is same, the same status as men under our constitution. So there is a direct line from the 40s, 50s, and 60s in terms of our struggle to where we are today. And so I asked Bahamians to really consider the civil and political rights that we fought for. Consider the sacrifices that our, our foreparents made. It didn't come easily. And so where we are today, we have to understand that it was a struggle and that nothing is given easily. And so today, we ask on June 7th that you support the principles of equality between women and men under our constitution and that you support non-discrimination on the basis of sex. It seems to me that um, under the I know that under the constitution it discriminates against both women and men. There is structured discrimination in the constitution and this is what we this is what we are trying to eliminate on June 7th. It two basic planks of any society women and men who experience disabilities under the pinnacle of our law, that is the Constitution. How can we have this in 2016 when we are talking about national development and good governance? Women in this country have struggled shoulder to shoulder with men from the time of slavery. We pay taxes, we shoulder the same responsibilities and burdens as men, and we ought to be awarded and given the privileges and rights under the Constitution. How can we move into 2017 with women really as second-class citizens? I am a second-class citizen in my own country. My four parents have struggled to bring us to where we are today and still women have not been given the right to equality under the Constitution. Having worked hard in the Burma Road riots, having worked hard on the contract, having worked very hard in the strike of 1958, having struggled for universal suffrage in 1962, women were instrumental in, in um, activating Black Tuesday, where the mace was thrown out of the window, Effie walks. Women played an instrumental part in the, in the fight to majority rule for 1967. We have been the backbone of the churches. We have been the, and continue to be. We are the backbone of the political parties. We work very hard in the trade unions today. And so what is it about that that denies us full enfranchisement under our constitution? Our history calls us to do the right thing. Our history calls us, as we did in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, to continue the pursuit of social justice in this area of gender equality and non-discrimination on the basis of sex. In addition to that, Bahamians, our state is under some international obligations, several international obligations that require us to address these inequities in our constitution. We signed on to several United Nations conventions 
that enshrine the principles of equality between women and men, that codify the principle of the right to non-discrimination on the basis of sex. The Bahamas government, any government, must comply with these international conventions. The one that is, that is right before us is called the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. This particular convention was ratified in 1993. And since then, the Bahamas is obligated and it is legally bound to comply with that convention to eliminate all forms of discrimination against women. So all on our state to do the right thing. And that's why we're having the referendum in 2000, sorry, on June 7th. And that is why we had an opportunity in 2002 to enshrine these two principles in our constitution. So I want to make it very clear that we have two sets of calls on us as a Bahamian people. The domestic call based on our history of social justice, pursuit of social justice and doing the right thing of civil and political rights and our international obligations. We have to comply with CEDAW, that's the acronym for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The Bahamas has also signed several other conventions which require us to, to implement laws, enact laws, to make sure that there's no discrimination against women or men. So, I say very clearly that we have a history, we are a people who are well positioned to understand in inequalities. We are a people well positioned to understand non-discrimination. And so it is time now, on June 7th, we vote to affirm those principles that our foreparents struggled for us to today. And we stand on their shoulders. And it seems to me that we demean this history. We do not affirm these principles of equality and non-discrimination on the basis of sex. I want to just um, end by saying that the Bahamas has, has long used the United Nations conventions to, to advance its own causes. For example, in 1965, in August of 1965, after the uh, United Bahamian Party would not change the, the boundaries in the Bahamas, Sir Lyndon Pindling, with a cohort of, of, of persons, went to the United Nations in 1965. We were still a colony. And they petitioned the United Nations on the issue of majority rule, one person, one vote. So I want to make it very clear that we have used UN, United Nations declarations and resolutions and conventions in our favor over the years. Every year we go to the General Assembly in the United Nations. So there's very little argument that this is being imposed on us. We freely contracted as a sovereign nation in 1973 to these conventions that now require us to do the right thing. So I want to make it very clear that in 1965, which was a turning point in our history, we had people like Cecil Wallace Whitfield, Doris Johnson, and Arthur Folks who went along with Celine Findling, Sir Milo Butler, Clarence Spain, and Arthur Hanna, and also Dr. H.W. Brown, and that was part of our road to majority rule. So we used the convention, or the declaration, which was called the Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries. We used that to our advantage in 1965. Sir Randall Fox also used UN resolutions in terms of the International Labour Organization to advance the rights of workers in the Bahamas. The women's suffrage movement used the Declaration of Human Rights to advance our right to vote. So I want to make it very clear that we are a part of an international community. We have privileges as members of the United Nations, the Organization of American States, and CARICOM. We also have responsibilities. So these two things combined, our domestic call for social justice and our international obligations. These are the two calls on us right now come June 7th so that we can hold our head up high and really feel the pride that our foreparents gave to us as a nation in the 40s, 50s, and 60s and before.
This is the sense of pride that I feel as a Bahamian in terms of my history and that I want to build on. It, it, that is the, the tradition that I would like to uphold as we move forward. And I also feel very strongly, I'd like to just um, say something about Dr. H.W. Brown, who was at the forefront of the civil rights movement in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The Beth, the, uh, the, the pastor at the Baptist Church, the leader of the, of, the, of the Baptist movement then. This is the tradition that we that, that gives me pride as a Bahamian. This is the tradition that really makes me feel a profound sense of my national identity. And Dr. H. W. Brown was one of the people who really shaped this national identity in terms of the struggle for the for, for civil rights. And so I really call on our church leaders to really follow the higher tradition, to follow the tradition that is progressive and positive and not take us back further than, 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 than before. This is a tradition that has given us the pride as a nation. And I stand on that pride. And this is why I think understanding all of this is really important as we go to vote on June 7th. Thank you, Marion. And so at this time, anybody who's tuned in on the YouTube broadcast can essentially just type in their comments in the comment section. Uh, any questions that you have? I know Fran also wanted to you know, chime in and maybe give her two cents. This is an issue that is very close to her heart. And the reason we're doing this webinar series is essentially just you know, for the same title that we gave it, Get the Facts um, from Legal Minds, is what we're seeking to do. And I think some things do get lost in translation, and a lot of people are also trying to figure out from a layman's perspective, how is this going to impact my life? Some people think that these are moves towards accommodating an elitist or minority group. Uh, I just pose the first question, how do you address that sentiment? Well, I think that I think the question really begs another question, Neil. And the question is, what is our relationship to our constitution? I think that's really critical. I think a part of the problem that we have been facing is that we don't know our constitution. We don't know our rights under the constitution. We don't know that it that it is the instrument that governs us and provides for governance in terms of judiciary the executive and the legislative. We also are not aware that chapter 3 of our constitution has the, the, the rights and freedoms laid out for us. And it is because we don't know the constitution really well, and we don't know what our rights are, our human rights, that, that, that we then ask that question, what does it mean for me? All right. So the constitution applies to everybody in the Bahamas. Whether you live in Bimini, whether you live in Acklands, whether you live in Anau, whether you live in Grand Baham or in Providence. The point I'm trying to make is that it applies to all of us, no matter what our profession is, no matter what our social economic status is. And so everything in that is about you as a citizen, particularly Chapter 3. So it, it, it doesn't apply just to the elite or just to people who are of, of a lower sex socioeconomic status. It applies to every single person in the Bahamas. And so I think if we understood that, Tanil, and understood that each of these bills affects every one of us as a Bahamian. So these bills are not about a middle class or an elite or lower economic class. It is about Bahamians, Bahamian citizens, all of those of us who live in this country are affected by our constitution. And I think one of the things that's really, really important coming out of this referendum, I think what this referendum shows, is we have a lot of civic work to do around our constitution. And so we wouldn't see it as a, a constitution just for the middle class. That is absolutely ludicrous. It protects the rights and freedoms of each and every one of us, no matter where we are in this country. And, and, and I trust that that, in part, responds to what you're asking, Tanil. button just in case. Okay. So, so for, for example, yeah. if, if I, I look at that, the right to freedom of speech, that doesn't apply just to, to, to elite people. It applies to all of us. Where, no matter what status, what economic status or social status you have in this country, you have the right of freedom of speech, right? The right to, 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 to be a member of a trade union. That is a right that belongs to every member of this society, not just to one class or another. 
So the point I want to make is that our rights and freedoms affect each and every one of us, and it is because we do not know them well enough that we then think, perhaps, that they just benefit one particular sector of our society. And so I would call for a real education, public education, public awareness in our schools, in primary schools. Our, our students and our children need to know this constitution, which governs us and affects our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, whether we know it or not. Okay. Uh, well, I guess for me, I, the, uh, as far as history goes, the question I, I would have, because of, I guess, of what I've been hearing from persons, uh, you know, people are, people feel that things are going to change the day after we and we're going to have, anyway, everything is going to go horribly, and this, and the whole of Bahamas is going to be a different place, and it's all going to be bad. And I guess what what I'd like to hear about is. You know, what, what were the arguments why women didn't get the vote when men got the vote? And, mm -hmm. and how did the world change after we did get the vote? Right. Well, I mean, I, mean, I think people always, it's, it's like doom and gloom is going to happen when any of these major shifts take place. I mean, certainly during the 40s, 50s, and 60s, people were very wary of, of a so-called um, leadership under Slindon Pinning and uh, a, a predominantly black people that people of African descent taking over the government. I mean, there was great fears around that. That was not just local, it was international. And so there's always these fears. But as we know, post-67, from Jordan rule and post-73, we had independence. People still felt secure. People were secure. Life went on. So the anticipation, I think, Fran, is more than, than the, actu the actuality of it. It certainly makes a qualitative difference that we became a sovereign nation in 1973, certainly, and the things that we could then do as a sovereign nation. So there is a qualitative change, but I don't think the changes are cataclysmic in that they totally pull the rug out of, out of, out of, out of, out of the from under people. So in regard to women and the women's vote, yes, people felt that um, if you gave women the right to vote, the Canadian Party in particular felt that it would inure to the benefit of the Progressive Liberal Party. Well, it in fact did. I mean, the Progressive Liberal Party finally won the, the majority rule. But it, I think people also felt that the, the right to vote was not really, um, should, should not be in the hands of women, because women just didn't know what to do you know, with the right to vote. Uh, and, and it's very similar now to, to some of the bills that we're talking about, in, in that we're saying that women really don't have the capacity to manage our lives. Well, all of that is not, you know, and, and we know that women are extremely responsible. I mean, I've said very clearly that women are the backbone of many of our institutions. And if it weren't for women in those institutions, including political parties, we're not sure where those parties would be right now. But the point I'm trying to make is that we always anticipate such grave and serious mayhem post some group gaining equality or some group gaining a right. When what happens is we wake up the next morning and life goes on and life is better, in fact, for all of us because we are then deepening our own democracy and deepening our sense of, of what is good governance. I don't think it's, like, you know, it's total mayhem. It's just not manageable. We have institutions that keep going in spite of, of rights that are given or, or acquisition and gains that are, that are had in any society. Okay. Um, can you speak to the distrust that currently exists um, within the society as it relates to this ref referendum, um, especially compared to the last referendum, because a lot of, you know, the talk that I hear is, well, they didn't listen to us on the last referendum, um, meaning the gaming referendum that took place. Can you explain the difference between the gaming referendum and this referendum? Because people seem to think that even if, no matter what they voted, it won't matter in this referendum. Right. It really matters in this referendum. This is a constitutional referendum, meaning that the Constitution will be affected. The Constitution will be altered if, in fact, the electorate agrees to that. And so what happens with a constitutional referendum? In this particular case, we have what's called entrenched clauses. So there is a procedure and a process that is set out in our Constitution as to how you can change these particular um, sections of our articles of our Constitution. And what it says, basically, is that you've got to have a three-quarters majority, at least, in the um, 
the lower house and a three-quarters majority in the Senate. After that, it then goes to the people, the electorate, on June 7th. And in that case, you need just a simple majority to pass each of those bills. The difference is that a constitutional amendment has a higher level of, of, um, of, of majority that, that's required in both the houses and then a simple majority in, in the electorate. The difference between the constitutional referendum and the gaming referendum is that the gaming referendum was not a constitutional referendum. It did not affect the constitution. All right? The gaming referendum was an advisory or, or, or public opinion poll referendum. All right, which was supposed to give the government a sense of what people wanted. At that time, the government said that it would abide by what the people wanted. And I think that is where the distrust came in, because what we know happened is that after the referendum, I think most people voted no, all right, the government then enacted legislation to regularize gaming. So people have, uh, are distrustful because they don't understand the difference between the gaming referendum and this constitutional referendum. What the people say on June 7th, the government bound, it is binding on the government to do what the people say on June 7th. It was not binding on the government to do what the people said on the gaming referendum. Okay, also another thing that I um hear a lot is I, I see a lot of people or hear a lot of people deflecting saying that this is not a gender equality referendum as opposed to a uh, immigration referendum or citizenship referendum. They seem to try and you know um, convince the public that uh, there is no discrimination that currently exists. Can you um, just break down the discrimination that does currently exist um, within um, the, the laws right now relates to citizenship between, you know, mothers and fathers in the Bahamas. Right. Well, this is a, a referendum about equality and not discrimination that affects the transfer of citizenship. So both go hand in hand. It's not one or the other. And it's not about immigration specifically. It is about equality between women and men under the Constitution and the provisions that where there are where there is discrimination against both women and men under the Constitution. So, for example, Bill 1 is going to... Currently in the Bahamas, a Bahamian man who's married to a non-Bahamian woman, if they have children outside of the Bahamas, those children are Bahamians. That is what the Constitution, that is the privilege and the right that the Constitution gives the Bahamian man married to a non-Bahamian woman. It is not the same for a Bahamian woman married to a, a non-Bahamian. Their children born outside of the Bahamas are not Bahamian children. So Bill 1 is trying to give equal treatment under the Constitution to the Bahamian man married to a non-Bahamian and the Bahamian woman married to a non-Bahamian man who have children outside of the Bahamas. We wanted that it's equal that both situations can transfer citizenship to their children. So that is a discrimination against a Bahamian woman married to a non-Bahamian man under the Constitution. The second bill deals again with the Bahamian woman married to a non-Bahamian man. The way the Constitution is framed right now, the Bahamian man married to a non-Bahamian woman, his wife has access to apply to citizenship under the Constitution and to be a naturalized Bahamian. The Bahamian woman married to a non-Bahamian man, her husband has no right under the Constitution to apply to be a Bahamian citizen. So we are so so again that is discrimination against the Bahamian woman. And we are trying to rectify that and address that by making it such that both the Bahamian man and the Bahamian woman married to non-Bahamians, both spouses can have access to citizenship under the constitution through application. That does not mean that citizenship comes the day after you're married or even a week after you're married. What it will mean is that there are safeguards in place that will allow for a spousal permit, permanent residency, and then citizenship at some later time. And I personally have known of, of people from on, 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 in both of those situations where citizenship doesn't come for 15 years. All right, 10 years, 15 years, or more. So it is not automatic that the spouses of the foreign spouses will get citizenship, but it will be a right under the Constitution for that to happen. The third one, then, is the discrimination against the unmarried Bahamian man. As it stands now, an unmarried Bahamian woman 
whose child is born in the Bahamas or outside of the Bahamas, that child is Bahamian. Not so for an unmarried Bahamian man. His child is not a Bahamian, no matter where it's born. All right? So what we're trying to do is to bring gender parity or gender equality to that situation where both the unmarried man and the unmarried woman can transfer citizenship to their children. So those are the three discriminations and the three inequalities that exist under the Constitution as we, as we sit here. And so we are trying to change those um, through, through the June 7th referendum. So it is about equality. It is about taking away the discrimination that exists for both women and men under the Constitution in regard to the transfer of citizenship. So it's both. Equality and citizenship issues are affected by, by equalizing both men and women under the Constitution. Okay, and can you speak to, because um, the most controversial one it seems to be is Bill Number 4. And everyone seems to be turning this bill into what they call the sissy bill or the gay marriage bill. Can you speak to the benefits of this bill as opposed to the rhetoric that's been uh, generated by a lot of people in the public just to try and persuade people uh, to vote no on it? Like, because what instantly comes to my mind is, you know, um, I know women have an issue with equal pay. Um, also, men have an issue with um, custody uh, of their children. So can you speak to the benefits of Bill Number 4 as it relates to eliminating uh, discrimination on the basis of sex? Right. So um, I'll, I'll just backtrack a little bit in that the um, Constitutional Commission put forward to, to Parliament that, that the, um, the word sex to be defined was to be defined because a lot of people in the general population wanted it to, to be very specific. And so we now have sex being defined for the first time in our Constitution. It is being defined as female and male. With this particular inclusion of the word sex as a prohibited category of discrimination, it will mean that no woman or any man can be discriminated against because they are female or male. That is, the Constitution will guarantee that. So it would mean that if I wanted, for example, to work at BEC, and I'm a competent woman, and I want to work on the high lines of BEC, which is now largely male-dominated, that will be my right. I will have a constitutional right as a woman not to be discriminated against because I am a woman and I will be allowed to work along with men on the high lines of, of, the, of the Bahamas Elect Electricity Corporation. So there are benefits. For example, in terms of men benefiting so that there's no discrimination against men, paternity leave, for example, is something that is not guaranteed to men who work in the public service, for, for example. So that is something that, that you cannot, you wouldn't be able to discriminate against a man and he would have a right to get paternity leave at the birth of his child. In, in regard to, to access to your child and custody of your child, well, the, the, we, we've already amended that so that the, the Status of Child Act allows for men to, to do exactly what you've, what you've asked. So again, the Constitution will anchor that and not allow any discrimination in regard to men with access to their, to their children who are born outside of a marriage or, or otherwise for that matter. So there are many instances where women and men will benefit from this guarantee of no discrimination on the basis of, of being a female or a male. If a man, for example, wants to be a primary school teacher he, and, and he's denied that because he's a man, he would have a constitutional right to fight that in court. So there, so there are many ways that this um, will bring more opportunities to both men and women to exercise their citizenship, to exercise their participation and contribution in this Bahamian society. Now we have Stacy online. She's saying persons are clearly not self-motivated, so how do we attract people to learn about the Constitution? I think it's a really good question. I think it has to be institutionalized. I think it has to be a part of our school curriculum. It's, it's, a, it's as simple as that. It's a part of the curriculum of other schools in civics, of other countries in civics, and it must be a part of our primary school curriculum, our high school curriculum, and our college school curriculum. It's as, it's, it's as simple as that. Apart from that, until that happens, or I, I think we as citizens should, should, should make that happen, but in addition, you can, you can have your own civil society groups who, who make it a point to study the Constitution and, and have the kind of um, legal education around it that, that you may need in terms of understanding it understanding it fully. 
Well, I know you have some place you want to be right now. <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time to come and speak with us about the history of equality in the Bahamas and a bit about the Constitution and all that good stuff. Uh, Marion, and if you just wanted to say anything in closing, uh, again, we're going to invite everybody to join us each Tuesday for the next few weeks at 7 p.m., right here, same spot, um, for the continuation of the series where we'll actually go bill by bill each week um, and take your questions and comments at the end as well. But Marion, I'll let you right. close out. Yeah, I, I think I'll just um, end where I started, um, Tania, just saying that the principles and values of gender equality, equality between women and men, and non-discrimination on the basis of sex really are critical planks in our move towards better governance, our deepening of our democracy, our national identity, and our national development. It is almost impossible, I think, moving forward to have that kind of sense of self-respect and dignity as the Bahamian without the equality between women and men and non-discrimination on the basis of sex. And I really ask us to look at our history and to anchor ourselves in that history and let it tell us how to move forward on June 7th as we vote in this referendum. Thanks again, Marion, and have a good evening, one and all. <laughs>